keep your questions and comments in mind as I uh, go through this, um, this, these slides, I got 22 slides and um, uh, give you a taste of the presentation that I'm giving and how I am uh, bringing an integral perspective to uh, academia, you know, albeit a friendly quarter of academia, um, there are still some folks on this conference who are, you know, deeply uh, progressive postmodern in their outlook. And so I welcome uh, being able to uh, interact with them. So without further ado, let me go ahead and share my slides. Okay, so this is the title slide. Uh, and, and I was invited not just, just to come to the conference, like most academic conferences, um, it involves the writing and the presenting of a paper. So I wrote this paper uh, entitled Cultivating uh, Neosphere Evolution in the Spirit of Teilhard and Whitehead. Uh, Rajul made that available for download for this group, although it hasn't been made public. And uh, part of the reason we're not posting it on the developmentalist is that the papers from the conference will be um, uh, published as an academic anthology sometime next year. So um, it's always good to get published in academia, you know, whenever possible. And so I wrote the paper, uh, you know, with that that kind of uh, audience and, and that sort of, uh, I, I try to be as academically rigorous while still making it relative. But if you read the paper, you'll see that I'm I'm somewhat assuming a familiarity with the work of Pierre Thierry de Chardin and Alfred North Whitehead, because all of these professional academics who are my co-presenters at this conference uh, are you know, world-renowned experts on these two great thinkers, and, you know, some have expertise in both. So there's a lot of overlap because there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of affinity between uh, the spirit, what you might call, of Teilhard and Whitehead, although they, they weren't even really aware of each other, even though they were uh, somewhat historically contemporaneous in their lives. Um, but the affinity between their work is undeniable. Uh, they are... A, a gigantic portion of what we might consider the canon of integral philosophy comes directly through Whitehead and Tehard. Both of them are gigantic founders of integral philosophy. Uh, and um, in my 2007 book, Integral Consciousness and the Future of Evolution, I have a long chapter, like a 45 page chapter, um, which is the intellectual history of integral philosophy, including prominent places for Tehard and Whitehead. Um, and if you uh, don't want to read that book, I can also point you to a, a presentation I did about five years back on the Daily Evolver um, called The Roots of Integral Philosophy, where Jeff Salzman and I discussed uh, the same people and, and basically had you know a podcast which covered much of the same ground that's covered in the book. So Tarrant and Whitehead are um, in some ways proto-integral. But in other ways, they're, they, they fully embody the spirit and um, they were certainly geniuses in their own right. So they have led to their own lines. I mean, so, so Tay Hardian scholarship is, a, is a, a, a subspecialty within academia. You know, Whitehead, he's, he's not as popular in mainstream academia as he once was, right, in the, in the 30s and 40s. Whitehead's kind of dominated, you know, like the University of Chicago philosophy department. He, he was, you know, a huge role. But then with the, the rise of uh, progressive postmodernism, not just the, the postmodern philosophy, but the larger progressive postmodern worldview that, that we understand as integralists, that really sort of displaced Whitehead, um, you know, from uh, academic fashion. Um, but uh, nevertheless, these two giants of history are very important to integral, and there's a, a, a huge amount of uh, affinity between their thinking and uh, the later developing uh, work of other integral philosophers. So moving to the next slide, uh, here's a photo of Whitehead and Tehard. Um, the, the thesis of the paper is that, that we can understand Whitehead and Tehard in a kind of a general spirit, a sort of a, a, an, a, a, an evolutionary appreciation of the universe that thoroughly integrates spirituality and religion, right? As you can see from the picture, Tehard was a, a Catholic priest, as well as a, a prominent scientist, a paleontologist. Um, Whitehead was not so much a, a Christian, although God features prominently in his work. It's just a rather um, 
specific kind of uh, uh, Whiteheadian God, if you will. It's it's not full blown theism, but I would say that that Whitehead is definitely you know a theist in his own way. But regardless of their religious predilections, um, I can say that as early kind of founders of this integral perspective, um, we can in a way read right off of their philosophy uh, instructions in terms of how we can deal with the uh, meta crisis, right? The challenges of our age, right? Um, within intellectual circus circles, uh, some of the more prominent uh, speakers and, and thought leaders have really made the meta crisis the, the focus of their uh, of their thinking and, and their um, their their public presentation. So I, I want to honor the fact that depending on how you look at it, uh, we're either on the brink of complete annihilation or you know we have some wicked problems we have to solve. But regardless of how dire you want to make these uh, these these challenges, you know, like climate change and uh, political decay and uh, global hunger and, and inequality and and uh, there, you know, I could make a long list of of problems and um, uh, I kind of do that a little bit in the paper. But the point of the paper is to say, look, the, the, this way of seeing this com generalized combined spirit of White and Tehard not only shows how we can uh, uh, grow out of our current circumstances and, and um, evolve into a, a, you know, a more capable kind of civilization that will have the wherewithal to deal with the crises that we face, um, but also they, they reading into the spirit of, of what they were about, especially the way I've interpreted it, I think they give detailed instructions about how we can go about uh, achieving and working for the growth we need. So the first thing that I, uh, I want to emphasize is this idea of the structural sequence of evolutionary emergence, right? According to Whitehead, I mean, the, his whole philosophy is known as process philosophy, although there were other philosophers prior to Whitehead, like Henri Bergson, who are considered part of the canon of process philosophy, or you might, might even identify, you know, um, a Spinoza as a process philosopher in his own way. So, so you know, Leibniz, there's, there's lots of insights early on about how the universe is best understood as a process. But of course, it's only after the discovery of evolution and Darwin that this process can be equated with evolution and, and, and the, the, the process philosophy can become a, a thoroughly evolutionary philosophy as is integral philosophy. So this is a, a, among the many elaborate illustrations of uh, uh, the structure of emergence with the Big Bang in the center of the spiral. And then the spiral indicates the, uh, the complexification of the universe. Right, beginning with the first atoms, hydrogen and helium, uh, through the first generation of stars, the supernovas, the second generation of stars, the, the um, periodic table of elements, which is a kind of a fossil record of cosmological evolution. And, and then, of course, the, the spiral continues with the emergence of life, or early life forms, the Cambrian explosion. Uh, it may be a little bit small according to this slide but uh you can find this graphic by on google images quite easily and it's it's fun to study it but this graphic and, and most accounts of uh evolutionary emergence end with the emergence of humanity right and so i've added this arrow to the to to make the point that this 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 process of evolutionary growth has a structure, right? So there's no, there really is no development that lacks a structure. And so even though it's, you know, it's more of a process than simply a built up structure, being able to appreciate the, the I would say, spiritual teachings, right? You know, the, um, uh, the idea of which way is up in the universe is, is uh, indicated by this structure of gradual complexification, which was understood well by uh, Teilhard and Whitehead. But Whitehead, um, I mean, Teilhard was really um, notable for his his framing of the structure of emergence uh, in, in, in a big picture way. And so he, he referred to it as 
the physiosphere, the biosphere, and the nuosphere. Now, let me just make an aside about the pronunciation of, of uh, what I call nuosphere, uh, you know, the N-double-O. It's a little bit, I, I kind of pronounce it like you would, zoological. Uh, and if you Google it, you know, there are some people who were trying to say that the correct pronunciation is noosphere. I would say both are correct. A little bit like Teilhard's name. I mean, if you listen to a French person say his name, after the T, there's no consonants. It's just Teilhard. <laughs> but in the community of practice at this conference among scholars, especially Americans, they've anglicized his name and they say Teilhard with the hard D at the end. So I'm aware of these pronunciation differences, uh, but I'm choosing to follow the scholars and calling, uh, referring to Pierre as Teilhard and um, the, the nuosphere as as with the, the new instead of the no. I say, just say no <laughs> to, the, to the noosphere. Uh, plus after 40 years of talking about it, it's hard to go back. Um, anyway, the structure of emergence extends into the nuosphere. And that is this, this sequence of transcendence and inclusion, right? What, what integral philosophy understands is a holarchy, which is a technical term, meaning that there's that the, the evolution isn't just a sequence like a chain. It's it's a sequence more like a, a, a series of nested dolls, like the nested Russian dolls, where there's envelopment, where, where each new layer builds on itself and takes up and uses the accomplishments of the previous layer. And, and one of the most amazing things about this structure of emergence is that we, each human body and mind, is a kind of a macrocosmic expression, right? Like almost every atom in the periodic table is being used in our bodies, um, especially hydrogen, you know, the first atom, right? Hydrogen means water creating, but, you know, it should be, it should be given some momentous spiritual name, like, you know, the first to appear or something, because it's really foundational, and hydrogen's created only one time in the history of the universe at the Big Bang, or, you know, shortly thereafter, when, uh, you know, the, the protons can cohere into atoms. And, and so the fact that, that our bodies are mostly water molecules, and those water molecules are mostly hydrogen atoms, at least two to one to the oxygen, means that the, 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 the accomplishment of the Big Bang itself is here in the present working as the foundation of our own structure of emergence. And not only is this a kind of a gee whiz element of science that we're macrocosmic expressions, both physiologically in the periodic table of elements, biologically in the way that we embody the, the eukaryotes and the, the, the vertebrates and the mammals and all those stages of biological evolution are in a sense being you know, in, incorporated within our um, mammalian bodies and you being used in the present. So the structure of emergence isn't just a historical record of how evolution came to this moment. It's also a living system that's alive in microcosm as a self-similar expression. And, and what makes this so, um, I think, doubly profound is that not only are we, are our bodies embodiments of the, the evolution in the physiosphere and the biosphere, but our minds are also, uh, in a sense, we embody the structure of, of nuosphere evolution as well, right? With the idea that, as I'll uh, explain as I go through the talk, that that the, the new sphere begins with the, the birth of, of human thought. And you might want to put that in a million years with the emergence of, you know, uh, uh, the first language, or you might want to put that at uh, a quarter million years with the emergence of the first Homo sapiens. We don't really know exactly when these things started, but regardless, uh, at some point, as Teilhard put it, thought is born, and the birth of that thought uh, continues as uh, humanity evolves, uh, both internally and externally, and, and in terms of both their individual consciousness and uh, their collective culture. That this structure from um, from the, the early uh, forms of cultural organization in tribes, uh, the later, more complex forms of organization in empires, uh, this tracks uh, the, um, the stages of development that are outlined in spiral dynamics and which are studied through developmental psychology, and I'll, I'll come back to that as well. But the point is that in the same way that we embody the structure of emergence in our physical being, we also embody the structure of emergence in our mental being because all of those accomplishments, the accomplishments of tribal consciousness, the, the accomplishments of warrior consciousness, the, the civilizing accomplishments of traditional 
consciousness are all they form a, an interactive system of levels wherein just like evolution is working you know in the physical way it's also working in in the noosphere in the noosphere as the, the these these um these accomplishments are taken up and used by previous uh, success their successor levels of emergence you know modernist consciousness can't really function without healthy versions of traditional consciousness this is a point i make at length in developmental politics, that this traditional uh, form of civilization is is civilizing, right? It, it gets people to uh, to do the right thing, right? To care about uh, uh, their their virtue and their morality. I mean, not everybody is so civilized within the traditional world, of course, but it still it brings that online in a way that previous forms of culture perhaps only were able to achieve in a, in a, in a, a less developed way. And and that civilizing process is 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 a predetermined. It, it allows modernity to m move to the next level, and and we can say the same thing about progressive postmodernism as a as a worldview structure. Um, that in a sense depends on the accomplishments of modernity, because without a society that's relatively prosperous and relatively free. Progressive postmodernism can't really emerge in any large scale way because it absolutely depends on those previous accomplishments. And we could also say that this next worldview, which we're interested in, uh, the integral worldview, it also could not emerge in the timeline of the uh, newosphere evolution without the very important accomplishments of progressive postmodernism. Right, many of the things we take for granted, many of the social norms and mores and, and deep. Uh, caring values, which the best of progressive postmodernism brings online, without that evolutionary emergence, this next step of evolutionary emergence, which we're excited by, um, wouldn't be able to take place. While I do think you, it's possible to skip a stage in your own personal development, I don't think it's possible to skip these stages in the larger realm of cultural development. And that's its own point, uh, which you can ask me about in the questions if you like. But just to kind of make it through the presentation here, I want to bring up what's known as big history because this has really captured the attention of the public, right? Especially Yuval uh, Noah Harari's *Sapiens*, which has uh, you know sold millions of copies, right? Uh, Harari is now um, a very prominent thought leader, kind of uh, very kind of embraced by the establishment. Uh, uh, really at the pinnacle of the prestige economy. Uh, and if you read his book, uh, while there's lots of good insights in there, and, and I'm glad that through his work and the work of David Christian, uh, also a best-selling author, that this idea that the, 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 the timeline of emergence that runs from the Big Bang to our modern era is really one unified story. Even though there's different methods of development, different kinds of evolution, um, this idea that, that we can appreciate the story of our origins as a kind of big history, right, which is the label for this category, um, is, is, you know, in its own way, something to be celebrate, celebrated and appreciated. But at the same time, um, when I read, for example, Harari's book, uh, and, and Christian as well, they're both operating within um, the dominant philosophical paradigm of modernity and the mainstream, which is the reductive physicalism. So they, in order to be part of the kind of the scientific club, um, they can't say anything that contradicts reductive physicalism when, especially in Harari's case, he has to embrace nihilism. You know, he's just naked nihilism in the book where he says, we all know the universe is absurd, and that any any meaning we give to it is just a fairy tale. But we have to, in order for us to develop further as a society, we have to buy into the collective fairy tale, even though it's just our, it's just our imagination. It has no you know authentic ontology or real you know substance. And I just read that. I don't want to tear my hair because it's so untrue and misleading for people who are otherwise being attracted to this idea of big history and being able to contemplate the structure of emergence. Um, when they, even though they bring in this idea, they don't, I don't think they use the word uh, neosphere evolution in, in any broad sense uh, because of Tehard's association with spirituality, uh, uh, of which they have an allergy. But um, the, the idea that, um, that, that 
the new sphere exists and it's a part of evolution and it's it continuous with the rest of the story um that that's a, an important step which you know at least uh, that i can applaud but of course um big history's been um uh been critiqued here's one critique uh it was an aeon magazine shortly after sapiens came out um big history reduces the vicissitudes of human history to processes that are ultimately beyond human control what this means is that big history necessarily privileges the cosmic at the expense of the human the natural at the expense of the political. And the underlying um, the underlying takeaway, I mean, that is Ian Hesquith, who's a history professor, he gets at it in a way, but the, the real problem, of course, is that there, there's no place for free will within reductive physicalism, even relatively free will, even a modicum of free will, which is absolutely necessary for Neosphere evolution to take place, right? And one of the triumphs of, of, of course, at least the claimed triumphs of Darwinism is that it shows how biological species could come about without any larger purpose, all through natural selection, right? Just through random mutations and environmental selection. It's kind of an automatic process or, or a, a non-intentional process. And while I think that... Um, you know, I would quibble with Darwinism. I certainly expect, uh, 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 I certainly accept natural selection as as an important part of how our species evolved. But um, I, I I don't think that that's a, a thoroughgoing explanation, and that's an argument that I make in Evolution's Purpose, my 2012 book. But the point I'm I'm making here is that um, when it comes to cultural evolution, neosphere evolution. It's not actual selection. It's it's not natural selection. It's actual selection, where people are actually trying to make the world a better place. And when they don't try to do that, the new sphere doesn't evolve. It's it, you know there are places in the world where people are are in the exact same cultural circumstances that they've been in for the last uh, you know fifty thousand years at least. But in certain other places in the world, indeed in most most places of the world, humans have found a way to improve their conditions. And it's by ingeniously innovating and striving to improve the human condition that our newosphere has evolved to the point where we can begin to see the big picture of big history. But in order to go beyond the problems of, of physicalism, we have to add to the physical, uh, that's the, the surface of things that is dealt with by big history, and look to what um, uh, Teilhard uh, famously called the within of things. Uh, this is a chapter uh, in integral consciousness where I try to lay this out uh, as accessibly as I can. Um, I show here this very simple diagram to, to sort of indicate that the new, just as the biosphere arises within the physiosphere, right? You know that life on Earth uh, emerges within this gigantic cosmos of the you know physical uh, stars and planets and matter energy and space time, and in a way, culture or the space between us, which is the primary feature of the newosphere. I mean, we can consider the newosphere to be both um, human culture, institutions, shared agreements, large scale worldviews, and of course also technology. Um, but I think Tehard saw the newosphere as the realm of thought. The thinking layer is how we refer to it. Um, I think with integral philosophy, we can make a place for technology, but I resist the idea that the newosphere is, is, is symmetrically half outside and half inside. I don't think that's necessarily an accurate description because most of what's going on in the newosphere, most of the substance of what's evolving is intersubjective rather than objective. That is, it's uh, it's it's the the relationships and shared values that constitute a culture, and the the emphasize the emphasis of this is is this idea of worldviews, right? So we're all familiar with worldviews because we're students of integral philosophy. Um, but the idea that a the structure of emergence continues into the newosphere, and and in the same way that the that emergence occurs through this sequence of transcendence and inclusion within these previous domains of evolution, that same pattern can be seen in um, in the newosphere. A point I just made. But what that pattern is, and what those those what those structures consist of, 
is not really uh, agreed upon, I, I, I don't think, within um, you know those who recognize the neosphere. Uh, that is, this that this idea of structure is is not um, it, 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 without um, a, an understanding of, of holons and holonic development. It's hard to really see or, or or say what it is, you know, what is the structure of new sphere evolution, and what I'm what I'm arguing in the paper and and what I can lay out here is that these large scale worldviews, right, these stages of development that are oversimplified by spiral dynamics, but are uh, you know a cornerstone of integral philosophy, these constitute the structure of emergence in the neosphere. So uh, for the people in the conference, I want to define what I mean by worldview. Um, you know, it's made up of values, uh, shared values, um, values cohere in sets or systems. This is why it's very important to have this within of things, this intersubjective ontology that can allow for worldviews to be somewhere besides just in our heads, right? They're not just in the words on the page or in the you know, the videos on the screen, they're not just whatever I think. The fact that they're shared large scale world historical systems of agreement, if we're going to posit these systems and identify some kind of value metabolism that gives them life and allows them to persist across multiple generations, then we, not, we need to ground their ontology or their, their beingness somewhere, right? They have to exist somewhere. And that's why uh, a, a huge... Um, a huge breakthrough, I would say, uh, that that um, we can see. You know, there's not one integral philosopher uh, that that is we can credit this to. Certainly, Ken Wilber deserves some, some significant credit in his quadrant model um, by identifying uh, the lower left, the collective, um, uh, 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 the collective, you know, interior as a, a domain of development and he gives it an ontology you know it's it's known as 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 intersubjectivity or social ontology within academic philosophy but um they have a, a an allergy to metaphysics and so wilbur's quadrants is not recognized by academic philosophy in any serious way and this idea of, of um that that there's a realm in between us that is never, it's within, it's part of the interior universe, but it, it it's nevertheless not just in our heads. It interpenetrates our minds. Cultural consciousness is, is an important part of how we think and make meaning. Um, but being able to allow for worldviews to have a space, a domain of development, it's, it's, it requires philosophy in order to frame that space. But once that space has been framed, we can, we can not only see the worldviews as systems more clearly, we can also work with them more effectively. You know, we saw something similar during the Enlightenment when uh, Rene Descartes framed objective and subjective, right? I mean, it was there all along, but this philosophical framing of the objective allowed people to see things they couldn't see before. It allowed them to grab hold of the stuff of the physical universe with um, with new power, which led to you know the scientific age and, and all of the wonders of modernity. So we're doing something similar now, or at least attempting to, by allowing for a realm where worldviews exist, the world in between us that has space, even though it's, I mean, space, you know, we might bring in the physics concepts of non-local, right? It's it's not, you know, the worldviews don't exist in, in a, an extended space but they nevertheless exist in this realm in between us and the internal universe. So this could be a whole talk in itself, but just to complete this definition of worldview so that they're coherent systems of values and ideals that persist across multiple generations. Worldviews are also widely held cultural agreements of what, what is good, true, and beautiful. I mean, what makes the good, the true, and the beautiful powerful and attractive is that, it's, that they're constituted by agreement and, and each of these worldviews on this spectrum of development can be understood as like octaves of the beautiful, the true, and the good. Each one has its own, you know, while there's overlaps and universals, we can also see how each worldview makes its progress and history by uh, uh, bringing forward a, a, a new frame of values, a new definition of the good life, uh, a, a new philosophy of, um, of, of what's real and what's true and, and what's worthwhile. So... Um, Goodness, truth, and beauty are an important part of what makes up these worldview structures, even though each has its own uh, distinct and sometimes there's 
uh, harsh differences between them, which I'll which I'll get to. But worldviews provide our sources of personal identity, at least partially, uh, and uh, uh, very important for political solidarity. And and again, what I'm arguing is that um, recognizing the structure of emergence within our bodies, within our minds, within the newosphere is a very important move that integral philosophy allows us to make, which is foundational for working for the growth that we need to deal with the meta crisis of our time. Okay, so going to the next slide. The idea that worldviews are the structures of emergence in the new newosphere, the primary structures, right? It evokes a stage theory. So most of us are familiar with stage theories, but as some of you may be aware, stage theories are very unpopular within progressive postmodern discourse, right? You know, the, the, and, and, and many people have said, oh, stage theories are, are they've taken the, 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 the simplified kind of schematics that are designed to make it accessible and useful, right? The, the downstepping of the complexity for something that could be used in a business seminar, for example, is worth its time. But then when people see that stuff online, they conclude the takeaway is that this is a highly simplistic and linear and forth fitting, you know, that it's, it, it, it's not a real kind of natural description of what's going on in the newosphere. And I think that one of the reasons why integral philosophy remains rather obscure, one of the reasons that it hasn't been uh, more influential in our time is that the, the, the primary evidence for stages of development that are pointed to by most of the uh, thought leaders within the integral space are based on the develop the evidence from developmental psychology, right? Even though, right, the, the Graves, uh, the founder of Spiral Dynamics, uh, talked about this these stages of development as biopsychosocial, meaning that they're part of the wiring of your brain and they're they're part of your subjective interior, but they're also collective as well. Um, you know, they acknowledge that. But ultimately, the people who are using integral philosophy are, are focused on the psychology of it, right? Like, so this person is, is you know, a traditionalist, or this person is a modernist. And, and again, within shorthand discourse, there's nothing wrong with that. But if we're trying to persuade a larger audience of the validity of this way of thinking, I would say that we, we have a much better, um, a much but we're on much firmer ground in pointing to evidence when we look at the evidence from history, right? So... You know, I would say that these stages of development that are identified by developmental psychology, um, that they've sold those or, or, or promoted those as, um, you know, stages of your psychological growth. Like how mature are you as a person? How evolved is your consciousness? But I would I would disagree with that. And then the more I think about it, the more I, I want to pick a bone with it, because um as I write in the uh, paper that I published in December regarding um, uh, human nature, right? Does human nature evolve? It's on the developmentalist. I talk about the, the influence of different kinds of, of larger factors on our personal consciousness. Some of it's biological, right? Our evolutionary psychology that we can never get away with it, away with, away from. And part of it is cultural consciousness that's coming to us from these large scale worldviews that we're embodying and using and identifying with, right? Some people um, allow these uh, worldviews to become who they are, right? They, 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 those, the worldviews think their thoughts for them. And then some people exemplify these worldviews in almost stereotypical ways. But there are plenty of people who use different worldviews at different times and, and others who don't uh, uh, channel or, you know, kind of imbibe large scale cultural consciousness very much at all, only kind of vaguely, right? It's hard to peg them as modernists or traditionalists. But when we point to this thesis about the stages of development in the newosphere, uh, as I say in the paper, exhibit A is the emergence of modernity, right? Modernism, right? During the enlightenment, this rational, secular, scientific worldview that certainly evolved on its own terms over the last 350 years, but is nevertheless has certain continuity, right, with the thinking of the Enlightenment, right? That, that modernity as a worldview, as a set of values, has intergenerational um, 
consistency and the modernity of today, even though it's walking, it's continuing to evolve, is a modernity as a worldview that's been around for at least 350 years in the same way that the traditional worldview, the pre-modern worldview, uh, various forms of religion as it takes, um, have been around for thousands of years and that these um, these worldviews are certainly evolving, right? The traditional consciousness of 2023 is not the same as the traditional consciousness of you know, uh, the year 23, of course, but um, nevertheless, there's continuities. And so we can say that these religious worldviews are important um, forms, structures, stages of culture that continue to exist in the present. And so even folks who might reject a stage theory or who otherwise, um, you know, have problems with it or don't buy into it, my argument is, look, you don't have to have an integral consciousness to recognize that 350 years ago, something momentous happened in history, right? Modernity emerged and has changed the world forever. And even though, you know, everyone alive today is sort of in the modern age, the majority of the world's population still live in, you know, cultural and civilizational circumstances that are pretty clearly pre-modern, right? They, they lack the important innovations of modernity, not just the technology and the prosperity, but especially the liberal values and freedoms, right, which are um, fruits of modernity in um, the developed world. So if you're willing to accept, and again, the, within academia, this idea of modern and pre-modern is, is used in so many different contexts that it's almost taken for granted. And so if you're willing to acknowledge that modernity represents a hinge of history, that something radical changed when that emerged, then you're already working with a two-stage model. And so to, to make the argument as minimal as possible, if you're willing to recognize this kind of pre-modern religious civilization and this modern secular scientific civilization, um, the proposition is, and this is still something that is hard for many current thought leaders to accept, but that there is, in the last 60 years or so, a, 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 another world historical significant uh, a worldview has emerged beyond modernity. Um, and of course, it's called the postmodern or, you know, the progressive postmodern worldview. And um, of course, I think pretty, pretty much everyone here is, is familiar with this idea. Um, uh, the jargon within this uh, movement is that this is the green worldview. Um, the word postmodern is a battleground of meaning, right? We're not just talking about uh, deconstructionist, you know, post-structuralists. Uh, it's not just postmodern philosophy or postmodern art. And, and, and the word term progressive is another word that's been used throughout history, but it's only recently that um, the mainstream media here in America, especially, has begun to uh, use the term progressive in, in, in a way that's not just a synonym for liberal, right? It used to be that liberal, progressive, it was just this kind of homogenous mass on the left for which they had many different labels, but now they're beginning to recognize that what they might call, you know, moderate uh, center-left people and farther left progressive people represent actually two different kinds of culture. So for the last three years, we've been using this term progressive postmodern worldview as kind of defined term to talk about this next stage of history. Um, I talked about it with uh, uh, Glenn Lowry on his podcast some months ago and he kind of, he somewhat balked at the idea that this you know this emergence. I mean, it's easy to see all the different elements of it separately, right? The environmental movement, you know, feminism, the gay rights movement, or you know, wokeism, or you know, whatever the different strains of progressive postmodernism. Um, the idea that they cohere into a world historical worldview with its own uh, kind of membrane that's that, that's a very hard proposition to land. I found. Right, like within integral discourse, everybody just nods their head because we all are, you know, it's evident, right? You can just see it almost everywhere you look. Once you begin to understand that there's these stages of development and we have traditional modern and postmodern, then you can't not see it, right? You can't turn on the news and see how evident it is. It's almost self-authenticating. Um, and yet, uh, you know, for modernists, for traditionalists, it's still a very hard swallow. Um, so, you know, in the presentation, I want to say, look, these are very important values, social justice, diversity, equity, equality uh, for, for um, different genders, uh, LGBTQ equality, environmental protection, animal welfare, 
world-centric morality, right? I mean, they don't always live up to it. I mean, there are many strains of progressive postmodernism that have regressed to a more ethnocentric idea of us versus them. But um, at least within the best, you know, within the, the, the minds of the best thought leaders within progressive postmodernism, the idea that everybody counts, that, every, that, that we want to care about everybody, not just humans, but all sentient beings to the environment, it's, a, it's, it's, it's grown beyond by modernity by becoming more inclusive, right? And, and that's a very important theme I want to return to here. Of course, I'm not going to be very popular at this conference for bringing up the negatives of progressive postmodernism, right? Within contemporary academic discourse, uh, you can have all kinds of nasty names hurled at you for suggesting that there may be pathologies accompanying uh, the, the positive values, but I'll list them here, right? Illiberalism, right? The sort of idea of the militant rejectionism. You know, if, you, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention, right? I mean, again, there's plenty of reasons, good reasons to be outraged. You don't have to be progressive postmodern to recognize the crises and the problems of the world that we face. But I mentioned all the different strains of progressive postmodernism. What binds all those strains together is this abundant agreement about the pathologies of modernism. Right, that is pushing off against modernity has been the way that progressive postmodernism has emerged in history and gotten traction and, and brought real evolution to the neosphere. So, you know, the strengths are also weaknesses and vice versa. But I mentioned here as its own bullet, uh, reverse patriotism, right? This was, uh, this was um, uh, parodied as blame America first. And in the same way that patriotism can be politically empowering, it can, it can galvanize people and give, you know, give them a reason to be loyal, reverse patriotism works in a, in a very similar way, right? So for example, you can see the fashion of, of, of decolonialism or decolonizing history, decolonizing government. Decolonizing is one of the watchwords of progressive postmodern folks, at least many of them, especially in academia. And again, there's some good things to it. It's not all wrong. I mean, there's certainly legacies of colonialism that we'd love to move beyond and dismantle or otherwise reject. But the idea that um, that that America represents some some kind of sinister criminal enterprise, and that and that the, 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 if you're enlightened, all you can do is take a dim view of it and and emphasize its crimes and its misdeeds, and that you know being patriotic about America, but that's somehow naive or, or you know, it makes you a, you know, a, a, a right-wing populist or something, right? So nevertheless, I think from an integral point of view, um, a degree of patriotism, just like it's important to integrate the levels, integrating a degree of, of healthy civic nationalism, I think is not only a good idea, it's also uh, critical for the stability and the, the health, health of our democracy. This idea of performative contradictions, you know, the classic performative contradiction is to say that there is no truth. You know, you can't say that. I mean, is that true? Is there is no truth? I mean, the, 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 the performative contradiction of modernity or post-modernity, progressive post-modernism, among the many, right? You can see it you know, everywhere in this discourse. But if you wanted to boil it down, you could say that the idea that no value system is superior to any other is being made from a superior point of view. Right. As soon as you claim that no value system is greater than others, you're pulling the rug out from under yourself because you're you, you can't say that unless your point of view is superior. That you're you're claiming implicitly that it's superior to see values as relative, which is itself a hierarchical move. Right. So it's important to appreciate this underlying nature of not just progressive postmodernism in general, but the whole nature of the antithesis is a performative contradiction. And that's a kind of a deep point, which I'll explain in a second. In order to understand these worldviews and see them within the larger structure of emergence, it's very important to take what Teilhard called a planetary perspective, right? This is how he was able to see this idea of the physiosphere, the biosphere, and the neosphere. And, and this idea of a planetary perspective pervades his work, and it, it kind of characterizes his spirit in a certain way. And if we take a planetary perspective, if we're willing to accept that the, um, the, the these worldviews constitute at least an important part of the structure of emergence of evolution in the neosphere, then taking an, a planetary perspective or what we might call an outside and above perspective, 
allows us to see these worldviews as I presented them in many different ways um, as, as along a timeline of their emergence in history, right? So these are the, the, the major American worldviews. Of course, there's still extant worldviews that are pre-traditional, and we're now working to try to um, uh, develop post postmodern or post progressive worldview, but those aren't really um, uh, they're, they're they're not a big influence at this point. And to, to for purposes of of landing it, you know, in an, in, a, in an audience that may not be familiar with integral philosophy, I like to say, look, modernity is like the bulge in the python. It still represents the center of gravity for about fifty percent of the American population. Progressives, uh, although they're you know they perhaps not as unified as as modernists in their view, they're still um, they, they represent a much larger uh, percentage of the population in terms of their cultural worldview than many of the surveys have have um, pointed out, like the Hidden Tribes survey, many of the Pew uh, poll. They sort of show you know progressive activists as being like you know eight percent or twelve percent or some small percent. But it depends on how they ask the question. And of course, the people who are doing the surveys would like to minimize, you know, progressive postmodernism as much as they can. And so designing a survey that shows it to be as small as possible is in their interests. Um, so I reject that. I think it's much bigger than that. Uh, and I would give it a round number of 20 percent. Um, and then um, also traditionalists. Again, these are centers of gravity. People can make meaning different, different worldviews at different times. But I uh, just for purposes of illustration, these circles I show, you know, this this thirty percent circle of traditionalists. Um, I, I would say that uh, you know, for example, not everyone who is uh, would call themselves an evangelical, uh, an evangelical Christian, is is has a center of gravity in the traditional worldview. But certainly, I would say most of them probably do, and thirty uh, percent of the American population identifies as evangelical. So if you also add, you know, conservative Catholics and Orthodox Jews and many other people who may be traditional in their own way without being particularly religious, we can certainly um, uh, recognize that traditionalism as a worldview or as a cultural structure is still larger than progressivism, demographically speaking. But again, this idea of the planetary perspective, it's not just a matter of recognizing these worldviews side by side. It's very important to see how they have emerged in evolution. Right. And, and this brings us to this idea of dialectical development. Right. So my formal definition of the process of dialectical development, which is in the paper, is um, a universal process through which uh, tension between differenti differentiated entities can cause transformation into more complex forms of integration. Right. And that's a kind of academic definition. And there are certainly other competing definitions. We could uh, you could write a whole book about what this dialectic is. Um, and again, the, the scope of a, a, a thoroughgoing explanation of it or you know, dive into its meaning and why it's so important to understand uh, is, is beyond the scope of this talk. But I show it here through this familiar uh, oversimplification of the processes, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, right? And um, the idea that there's, there's a, a extant condition and that as, as time goes by, the extant, extant condition begins to decay and its, uh, its pathologies become more and more evident as it succeeds. And, and the only way to really solve the problems that are created by the thesis is to break out of it and to move in a direction which is away from it, pushes off against it, is antithetical to it. Uh, this process can be seen in the development of the, of the physiosphere, in the biosphere, and of course, very evidently, in the development of the neosphere. And we can see it here in the sense that progressive postmodernism as a worldview really you know, represents this, this stage or this movement of the dialectic, as it's called, of antithesis. I mentioned that it's pushing off against the thesis of the establishment, you know, as they originally referred to it in the 60s, the establishment of the, of the civilization, which was made up of a kind of a truce between traditionalism and modernity. Even though they had their own dialectic, uh, the the postmodernism again, you know, rejectionism, um, uh, you know, kind of vilification of the previous level. There are many things about modernity that must be rejected, right? There are many things about it which are dangerous and unsustainable, and pushing off against it is is the appropriate move, really, for 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 historical and and cultural progress. So even though it's moving in antithesis, this progressive postmodern worldview 
um, is is laying down a step of evolution or a stage of history that's that's very important. You know, I mentioned earlier that we're not going to get to this integral worldview unless we're able to include the, the values, the caring values of progressive postmodernism and its very important accomplishments. But what I'm arguing is that the combined spirit of Tehard and Whitehead really points to this next step of cultural evolution, which is this move to synthesis. Here's another way of looking at it. Um, we can see you know, the progressive, the modern, and the traditional, as I showed in the previous slide. But here I've drawn rather crudely this idea that there's something emerges beyond you know, postmodern, you know, I'm calling it here post-postmodern, and these arrows indicate that it's trying to include the whole. And this is where this idea of how comes in. How do we move to this next great stage of history? I think that the, the move involves being more inclusive. That's how each of these worldviews gain their traction in history in the first place, right? Traditionalism, the religious worldview, is, is able to grow because at least one of the ways it's able to grow in history and emerge beyond what came before is that it's able to include different tribes, different ethnic groups, right? It used to be that, that different ethnicities or different racial groups were naturally at war with each other. But when we get an overarching religion, we can include these different groups and, and create a larger sense of social solidarity. So it's you know primarily by inclusion that, that the traditional worldview um, makes its advance, right? And then with modernity, we, we, we draw the circle of inclusion further to include just not everybody who's in the same religion. You know, it's like you the religionists have solidarity, but the other people are the infidels. When we have modernity, we are able to inc include multiple religions. Then with um, progressive post-modernity, th this inclusive social norm and this ethic goes further and um, includes those who've been marginalized. You know, or or victimized. It, it it draws the circle of compassion much wider, and that's one of the most beautiful things about progressive postmodernism. So, how can we transcend those caring values while including them? The answer is this: next step of inclusion is to uh, include modernity and traditionalism in a way that progressive postmodernism is unable to because of its position of antithesis. The job it's doing is a job of antithesis. It can't become the synthesis unto itself because its values are shaped and charged by being in, um, you know, in opposition to what came before. So we can do both. With this, this integral world, you can transcend and include. It can transcend progressive postmodernism's path pathologies you know, as I pointed out in that slide, and it can include modernity and traditionalism. And uh, this slide here um, uh, sort of over explains by showing how there's both the direction of inclusion going down and the direction of transcendence going up, and ultimately values achieved in both directions by including and by transcending. And that's, um, that's its own uh, segment of talk. But just getting through here, one of my favorite ideas from Whitehead, which is really brought out by one of Whitehead's most able philosophical interpreters, David Ray Griffin, was that Whitehead's criteria, a criterion for judging what evolutionary progress is or how it's achieved, he said it's the, it's the, it's the capacity for experiencing greater amounts of intrinsic value. And, and you know, Whitehead using the God word, he said it even more simply. He said, the purpose of God is the attainment of value in the temporal world. So what does this mean for integral? It means that, that the move of expanding the scope of what you're able to value, including progressive values, modernist values, traditional values, even pre-traditional values in your own purview, recognizing how these values work together, that's a move of inclusion which represents the evolution of consciousness. And these uh, these geniuses, Whitehead and Teilhard, both saw in their own way how this is how we can, I mean, there's, you know, the, how consciousness evolves, how the evolution of culture and consciousness can be cultivated is a deep and rich subject. But at the surface, you know, at the Institute for Cultural Revolution, our theory of change is that people's consciousness evolves when they expand the scope of what they're able to value. And we can read that insight right off of Whitehead uh, and his interpreters. Here's a graphic from Integral Consciousness that illustrates the synthesis in a different way. Um, you know, there's a polarity, the, the, the pull from within and the pull from without. And, and, and this polarity can be transcended 
uh, this idea of a dialectical logarithmic spiral, a spiral that's growing wider, uh, in includes both um, the idea of, 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 of cyclical change and vertical growth, because it, it's cyclical in the same that the, the spiral is returning to the same point as it moves up, but it's also vertical in the, in the sense that it's, that it's actually growing, that it's going beyond what came before. And this tries to show those three different, you know, the, um, the thesis, the antithesis, and the synthesis as three different lines. One of the ways of summarizing this is that the degree of our transcendence is ultimately determined by the scope of our inclusion. Um, it's almost like a, um, a, uh, a, a, a principle, right? That, that another way of putting it in the context of polarities is that um, the best way to forward in, in an interdependent positive, positive polarity, the best way to forward our preferred pole is to affirm the values of the pole we oppose. And, and that relates directly to this idea of the degree of our transcendence is only determined by the scope of our inclusion. Um, our ability to, to make the world a better place uh, ultimately depends on our ability to um, work with these forces in a way, uh, because once these forces are alienated, once we're disconnected, once we're de-inclusive, de um, then pathology often results. Um, and so the, my call to action uh, for uh, the folks who are at this conference and the folks who are on this call is that those who understand a new sphere of evolution, even if partially, are really called to become advocates for our culture's next evolutionary step, right? So we could be partisans of our particular preferred culture. We could be partisans of modernity or partisans of progressive post-modernity. But ultimately, if we want to be integralists or we want to use the spirit of, of Teilhard and Whitehead, then uh, if we want to be part of the part of the solution instead of part of the problem, then that means recognizing a certain amount of duty or, or opportunity to stand for the synthesis and to work to synthesize all the various oppositions that we encounter in our culture today. And uh, as the final slide, as Whitehead put it, it's through this process of synthesis that the many become one and increase by one.